Here's a report from Eric Severide from the war zone. The French defenses are reforming tonight. I was in my 20s reporting from Europe. I knew nothing of war. I hated war. I was just beginning to understand that there are forms of life that are worse than death. That there are causes worth dying for. Tonight on The American Experience, Eric Severide's Not So Wild a Dream. Major funding for the series is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Corporate funding for the American Experience is provided by Aetna, Insurance and Financial Services, for more than 130 years, a part of the American Experience. Hello, I'm David McCullough. An odyssey, the dictionary tells us, is a long, adventurous wandering. Once in another time, but not all that long ago, two young men set off in a second-hand canoe to prove they could paddle north from Minneapolis clear to Hudson's Bay, a distance of more than 2,000 miles. One of them was Eric Severide, and his tale of that remarkable expedition is part of what follows in a film based on his now classic autobiography, Not So Wild a Dream published first in 1946. I hadn't the faintest conception of what we were really letting ourselves in for, he wrote. Nor had he the faintest conception of what history had in store for him. He became with William Shirer, Edward R. Murrow, Ernie Pyle, John Hersey, one of the great correspondents of World War II. His larger story, his greater odyssey, is a journey and outlook that many Americans made from homegrown certainties about ourselves new ideas about the country's place in the world. reforming tonight. New big guns are the report of Eric Severide in the French capital. Anti-aircraft cannon in Paris are firing somewhere in France by Eric Severide. The future of France and all Europe may be decided. I was in my 20s reporting from Europe. I knew nothing of war. I hated war. I had grown up believing that my countrymen could stay out of war. My boyhood beginnings here on the North Dakota prairie had conditioned me to feel isolated, to think like an isolationist. After all, this is a precise geographical center of the North American continent, just outside of my hometown of Velva. Here there seems no roof to the sky and no border to the land. There was peace here, and it did not seem so wild, the ancient dream of universal brotherhood. War, if it did come, was for others far away. Arnold Eric Severide was born in Velva in 1912, two years before the First World War. Velva was a small town, population 837, mostly Scandinavian and German farmers 
good Christians and hard workers. They settled along the banks of the Mouse River. The small brown river curved around the edge of our town. Even as very small children, we could sense the river's life-giving nature and meaning to the farmers, to us all. Velva was only one of the various villages strung upon the river's wandering length. But naturally, we felt we exercised particular rights of possession over its flowing. A wooden bridge led to the city park where picnics and pageants were regularly held. Just beyond the park was the baseball diamond, and beyond that, the swimming hole. A very special place, the swimming hole, the favorite place of my childhood sweetheart. My father built the house I grew up in. It's still there, and it looks exactly as it did during my childhood. This is a picture of me when I was 12. My family called me Buddy. My older brother, Paul, was the outgoing member of the family. My younger brother, John, was a quiet one. The darling of the family was my younger sister, Jean. I would read books to her. My mother, a courageous and beautiful lady, was from the mystical East, Iowa. My father was a farmer and small-town banker, and a strict disciplinarian. My father was of the second generation of Norwegian pioneers who came with the Swedes, the Germans, and Danes to this bleak and barren northwestern country. He was born in America, but my father was still close to the old country and he spoke with a slight accent throughout his life. I hated the Norwegian tongue and refused to try to learn it. North Dakota, why have I not returned for so many years? Where is its written chapter in the long and varied American story? I was that kind of child who related reality to books, and in the books I found so very little about my native region. And very early, I acquired a sense of having no identity in the world, of inhabiting an outland, a lost and forgotten place upon the far horizon of my country. Wheat. So far as Velva was concerned, wheat was the sole source and meaning of our lives. We were never its masters, but too frequently its victims. On the mercy of the wheat depended the presence of new geography books in the red brick schoolhouse, a new ranger bicycle from Montgomery Wards, good humor in my father's face. It was our setting and scenery. It was rarely long outside the conversation. Just before World War I, the farmers in Velva were prosperous. Life was good, and there was little worry about the rest of the world. A popular song of the period expressed it well. We'll find a perfect where a joy never out there beneath a kindly sky. We'll build a sweet little nest.
years of the First World War, the demand and prices for wheat soared. It was like a second gold rush. It seemed as though the bonanza would go on forever. This was the wheat rush. So recklessly they plowed and planted the same crop year after year. They grew momentarily rich in the years of the First World War, but then the rain ceased. By now, the original buffalo grass, which had preserved the soil, was long since plowed away. And without rain, the earth lay dried and desolate, the color of old mud. And the hot prairie winds of summer, with nothing to stop them, simply transferred the topsoil in the form of fine dust to faraway places. The World War I boom was over. Farm prices dropped, taxes went up, income went down. The inevitable result was foreclosure. Farms that had been in families for years were lost. Farm auctions became a familiar and dreaded sight. God knows how families survived those years, but they were tough and patient people, and they always talked of next year, next year, until even a child could grow sick of hearing it. Perhaps it was our common dependence upon the wheat that made all men essentially equal, but I do know now, having looked at society in many countries, that we were a true democracy in that huddled community of painted boards. A man might affect pretensions, but he could not pretend for long. We lived too closely together for that. No doubt, there was envy at times and small bitterness here and there, but no man lived in fear of another. This was an agrarian democracy. Were the people of my boyhood years morally superior? Probably not, but order and democracy demand self-restraint. There was no other way we could live together. Why couldn't the rest of the world be like us? In our public schools, they taught us equality and cooperation. In church, they taught us kindness, and in our homes, honesty. We did not practice charity, we called it neighborliness. Later, I read all the exalting literature of the great struggle for a classless society. Later, I watched at first hand its manifestations in several countries. It occurred to me then that what man wanted was velva on a national, on a world scale, for the thing was already achieved in miniature out there, in a thousand miniatures scattered along the rivers and highways of all the West and Middle West. The working of democracy is boring most of the time and dull compared with other systems, but that is a small price to pay for so great a thing. Somewhere in another world, there were places like London and Paris and Berlin. I had read and dreamt of such marvelous cities, but they were not of our universe. Their troubles were not of our making or solving. In 1925, Velva's troubles, the drought and collapsing farm prices, did not spare the Severide family. Their crops failed and the bank closed. They lost everything. It was time to move on, to leave Velba behind. The family relocated in Minneapolis, where Severide's father got a job in a bank as a cashier. These were hard times for the Severide family. Eric, still called Arnold, entered Central High School, class of 1930. He took odd jobs to help the family and struggled with adolescence. The high school period, in America anyway, is surely the worst period in a man's life. At least it was for me. The most awkward, uncomfortable, inept, and embarrassing of all times. 
It's astonishing how little one is taught in these schools, or at least how little one absorbs of what they must be trying to teach. The virtues of the system have little to do with the intellect, but they are real. Through competitive sports, a boy learns that the worst disgrace of all is to let the team down. Intellectuals go through a phase where team spirit is a joke. But later, I saw it win a war for my country. Severide was president of the student council and editor-in-chief of the school newspaper. The high school yearbook said of him, a purpose true, determined will, pep, ability, and skill. I finished Minneapolis Central High School in the summer of 1930, having learned nothing except how to put the school newspaper to press. Believing that America was superior to all other countries in all possible ways, that labor strikes were caused by unkempt foreigners, that if men had no jobs, it was due to personal laziness and vice, meaning liquor, and that sanity governed the affairs of mankind. And then I did something harebrained, but rather magnificent. Why, I don't know. The wanderlust of youth, perhaps, or the macho ethic of the time. One must test one's manhood. With an older boy, much admired by me, Walter Port, I paddled and portaged a canoe 2,000 miles from the Mississippi at Minneapolis to the North Atlantic at York Factory, Hudson Bay. Proving, which anyone could tell from a glance at the map, that one could travel straight through the heart of the continent all the way by water. The Minneapolis Star, looking for any way to increase circulation, advanced them $100 for weekly articles about their adventures. They traveled in a second-hand 18-foot canvas canoe. They had no radio, no accurate maps, only an old army compass to find their way. They christened the canoe Sans Souci, without care. It was not so much a test of the body, it was a test of the will and imagination. I had entered a contest with myself. I knew instinctively that if I gave up now, it would be easier forever afterwards to justify compromise with any achievement. I was very afraid. By early September, I was weeping to myself with regret. Death came closer than we realized, not once, but time after time. We were sucked into the current of the uncharted God's River, and we knew we were in for a struggle. The intervening period was and is unsurpassed in my life for sheer concentrated misery. The rain poured day and night. The frost came. We were running out of food. We were falling far behind our expected schedule. We nearly lost our lives several times and felt that undefinable sensation of having pushed one's luck too far. Somehow we found some inner strength and on the last day we paddled nearly 60 miles without pause. We struggled with a mysterious force that we did not realize was the incoming tide. But then we smelled it. It was the sea. We had finally arrived after a journey of 2,000 miles by canoe at the old trading post of the Hudson Bay Company. It was the first time I had ever seen the ocean. Life, it seemed, was a relentless, never-ending battle. I began to take stock of the situation and discovered that the men who got to the top were nearly all men who had studied in universities. It was fear as much as anything else that drove me to college, purely personal ambition as much as curiosity about the world I lived in. I was 20, and like most of my classmates of 20, knew nothing. 
We were just discovering the exciting world of ideas, the world of theory and of principle. In 1932, the University of Minnesota was in a state of intellectual ferment. With my college generation, a new thing developed, the student movement. We believe passionately in freedom for men and in the integrity of the human personality. And we sought these ends not by changing the individual, but by changing his environment. These were the years of the tragic depression. We observed bread lines from the streetcar as we went to school carrying the books that described the good society. And every day, the headlines spoke of riots, of millions thrown out of work, of mass migrations by the desperate. Crops were being plowed under and millions suffered from malnutrition. Teachers were on the bread lines and vast sections of the country were populated by illiterates. All this was happening in the richest country on earth, a country that possessed all the political rights and instruments by which free men could change their condition, and still they could not prevent this. The system did not work. To us, it was all a mess. We refused to accept it as inevitable. In the summer of 1934, a violent truck driver strike erupted in Minneapolis and tore the city apart. Radical members of the Teamsters Union moved in to organize the city's truck drivers. Business leaders countered by organizing a citizen's army to break the strike. There were several deaths and many on both sides seriously injured. Severide, still in college, was hired by the Minneapolis Journal as a part-time reporter to cover the strike. The whole city divided in its sympathies. There were fights every day. Mostly the victims were strikers. The police set a deliberate trap one day. The truck drivers walked squarely into it, and 50 or more of them were shot down with buckshot. Nearly all the injured strikers had wounds in the backs of their heads, arms, legs, and shoulders. They had been shot while trying to run out of the ambush. Suddenly, I knew, I understood deep in my bones and blood what fascism was. I had learned the lesson in such a way that I could never forget it. I went home as close to becoming a practicing revolutionary as I would ever be. My father stared at me and said, I did not ever think that one of my sons would become a revolutionary. I had not understood that to some people like my father, the institutions of public order were endowed with a religious sanctity. Throughout the summer, Severide saw violence close up and came to hate it. Severide became a leader in the student movement that was sweeping college campuses in the early 30s. Like many students around the country, he was disturbed by labor unrest and the Depression. But what took hold of him politically was the peace movement. The University of Minnesota was a hotbed of liberal and radical student activity. The students were reacting to the futility, carnage, and waste of World War I. Reports of profiteering by munitions makers strengthened their anti-war feelings. To us, a new war would mean the end of all we believe we live for. We began to detest the very word patriotism, which we considered to be debased, a cheap medallion with which to decorate and justify a corpse to make the world safe for democracy. But where was democracy now? Mussolini had destroyed it in Italy, and Hitler was bringing it to a violent death in Germany. While we began to accept with dismay the probability of a European war, we remained desperately anxious to keep America out of it. We were part of a nationwide student revolt. There was a wild scene on campus one afternoon when two or three hundred students assembled to debate the Oxford Oath. In its American version, it solemnly pledged, I will not bear arms for flag or country. We accepted the pledge overwhelmingly, and I voted for it. A 
Of all the instruments designed to uphold the existing order, I think we most hated the military establishment. We would still have opposed it on this ground, but with less personal revulsion, had we not been forced against our will to take military training at the University of Minnesota. It was called ROTC, Reserve Officers Training Corps, and we did not like it. We regarded the uniform as a convict suit worn by inmates of the prison house of the human spirit. And we despised all those who willingly donned it. The University Daily was carrying on a vigorous campaign to end the compulsory aspect of military training, and we all pitched in. When a brilliant philosophy student named Kaplan was suspended from school for skipping his military classes, I got hold of the story, and we made an issue of it. This forced a trial of Kaplan before a tribunal of army officers who found Kaplan guilty. The officers took their secret verdict to President Kaufman, who overruled them and reinstated the student, much to their embarrassment, made more acute when I learned the details and published the story. As time went on, the ROTC officers came to regard me as their enemy and listed me as a campus radical who was trying to undermine the Republic. We became very quickly feared by the university administration, and for some reason. Despite attempts by the university to censor the newspaper and to intimidate us, no less a figure than the governor of the state sided with us. Our campaign to change ROTC was successful. And on June 18, 1934, 60 years of compulsory military training came to an end at the University of Minnesota. My anti-militarism took its toll on me right away. I did not realize it, but I had made an unforgiving enemy of the university president. By his direct order, I was denied the one position that I had worked three years to attain and thought I deserved, the editorship of the student newspaper. And for the first time, I tasted the ashes of bitterness. In the summer of 1936, at the age of 23, Severide put college behind him and began his first full-time job as a reporter for the old Minneapolis Journal. Fresh from the theoretical battles of the classroom, I was acutely concerned with the developing ideological struggle in the country. A couple of acquaintances came to me with the information that a semi-secret fascist group, the Silver Shirts, was organizing widely in Minneapolis, and I went to work. They worshipped a man named William Dudley Pelly, organizer of what they called the Christian Party, devoted to driving out the Jews from America and countering the Communist Revolution. They sang the praises of Adolf Hitler and longed for the day when their leader would come to power as the Hitler of the United States. They were quite mad. But I took them seriously as an advance guard of fascism and exposed the organization in a series of articles. When the first article appeared, the paper sold several thousand extra copies, and my personal life became a torment. Angry telephone calls and threatening letters came into the newspaper every day. Lifelong subscribers called to protest. They were nasty. I lost my patience and talked back. They telephoned the publisher, and to my disgust and amazement, I was lectured for being rude to a client. Severide again had offended authorities. His pro-union activity, and in general, his liberal view of the world, did not sit well with the publisher. Suddenly, without warning, he was fired. Like his father, who left Velva when his world collapsed, it was time to move on. It was 1937, the year of radio, swing, and war. 
Japan invaded China. Hitler and Mussolini were on the march. And Americans were dying in the Spanish Civil War. It was also the year that Eric Severide and his young bride, Lois, a law school graduate from the University of Minnesota, left Minneapolis for Europe, a journey that would change Severide's life. We knew in our bones that World War was coming. I had known it since the Nazis burned the books. Those who hated intellect and art must try to destroy the civilization that produced them. We wanted to see it before it was gone. Paris. What one had not been prepared for was the spaciousness, the serenity, the grandeur. It was something that I had known all my life, that everyone who reads, however distant he may be, has known forever. It is just Paris, forever new, and the fascination never leaves. Every detail was fresh and strange, and yet exactly as it should have been. There is a smell in the continental cities, a wonderful smell that excites the blood. It is composed of many odors, sharp and mellow and faintly sour. The smell of fresh bread, of roasted coffee, of old leather, of people. The French wanted to talk to you, and they just took you for what you were. It's in Paris that people cease their traveling. It is a place to stop. I did, and I found a job. Severide had an ideal job as a reporter on the old Paris Herald. He was free to write about whatever amused him. But inevitably, the subject turned to war and fascism. It was hard to escape, particularly the Spanish Civil War, which stirred passions of both left and right in Paris and touched Severide deeply. From early university days, we had understood that fascism implied war. A deliberate assault upon reason made inevitable an assault upon order. The preliminary assault was almost over now in Spain. And the bleeding, scattered victims were struggling toward sanctuary. Hatred and the bitterness ran like a river straight from the Pyrenees to Paris. Americans I knew were returning from Spain hollow and sick from emotional exhaustion. One personal friend, the studious, stubborn, owl-like Jimmy Lardner, said simply, all you guys will have to meet this thing somewhere pretty soon. I just decided I'd like to meet it in Spain. He was killed a few weeks later, one of the last American volunteers to die in battle there. In Paris, we could do little more than try to help the sick and wounded. They were the first casualties of war I had ever seen, the first men who were victims of fascism in their bodies. The sight left one numb and sick. This was it. This was what was going to happen to millions more, to your friends and perhaps to yourself. This is what the struggle, which began with ideas, came to in the end. Severide became obsessed with fascism and the threat of war. Broken and bitter refugees from Spain and Germany told stories of Nazi brutality that seemed incredible. 
the only way to truly understand it, he decided, was to experience the Third Reich. Severide and his wife headed for Germany. I knew I did not truly understand. It was a clear necessity to live inside Germany, however briefly, and make an effort. We knew Germany and the Germans because of our childhood and youth in the American Northwest. We heard much about World War I and conquest, but to me, Germans were just the broad, pleasant neighbor women who opened the kitchen door and handed us coffee cake fresh from the iron oven. There's little difference between the makeup of Munich and that of Minneapolis. These houses were as houses should be, well-defined, set apart, numbered in the orderly way that houses should be numbered. We could read the faces and could place in the structure of society everyone we saw. Because Germany was part of our intimate lives, we knew how it should have been, and therefore we could see very clearly how in this December of 38, it was utterly warped and changed. The place had been poisoned. The place was sick, heavy with a fog of unhappiness that was composed of suspicion and hostility, private shame and self-reproach, and belligerent, arrogant justification. Ever-present, more vibrantly alive than any living man, was the painted portrait of Der Führer, the burning eyes looking straight into your face, into the back of your head when you turned away, the stiff, upraised arm pronouncing its inescapable curse. And on the door of every house were the stark and ugly words, Jews not wanted. The people of Germany were sick, neurotically sick, their nerves on edge. They hated the world and they hated themselves. You had only to experience the spirit of the Reich and you knew there was no way to halt and go about the peaceful business of men. The suspense could not very long be born. Something had to happen. From Munich to Nuremberg, from Nuremberg to Cologne, it was the same. Soldiers everywhere. The fresh-faced, simple, polite German boys in field gray. The faces I had known all my life. The faces from the churchyard in the Minnesota town the honest, dumb German youth. Youth was innocent, yet it was a youth of Germany that was so frightening, so terrible. America in the summer of 1939, a world apart. Some called it the last innocent summer. America was in an isolationist mood and wanted no part of Europe's troubles. The King and Queen of England paid a royal visit to America that summer. It was a public relations trip to gain American support in the event of war. They won our hearts, but that was all. America was sticking to its isolationism. In Paris, Severide was trying to write about the war he thought was inevitable when a phone call changed his life. It was a call from London. Ed Murrow was on the other end, asking if I would like to try reporting by radio. He said, I like the way you write and I like your ideas. I was flattered, scared, but willing to try. We take you now to Paris. Good morning, this is Eric Severide in Paris. The French people got up this morning to face one more day of this crisis. CBS executives did not like my manner of speaking, but Murrow stuck by me and convinced them that I would be all right. Last night's story of general mobilization in Poland were denied this morning officially. I began reporting from Paris to America every night that tortured and suspenseful summer as Europe edged toward war. 
There was no denying, however, that the situation seems to have reached a point of intensity where it is hard to see where it can go on. But something must break one way or the other. Just 48 hours after Severide's broadcast, it did break. Early on the morning of September 1st, 1939, Germany invaded Poland. World War II was underway. Parisians were heartbroken, but did not show it. Life went on as usual. I don't know what I had expected. Perhaps I expected the life of the city to come to a dead stop. Didn't they understand that everything now was changed, that it could never be the same again? But they continued to go through their ritualistic motions. It was absurd. There were characters moving on a cinema screen, and I was alone in the audience. We hung around the Garde de l'Est with France once again mobilized for war. They did not look like soldiers beginning a war. They looked like soldiers at the end of a war, when soldiers resemble any other tired men. Their wives came with them to the station, hanging to their arms. Their eyes had the dry glaze from all night weeping. No bands played. There were no flags. Nobody shouted any orders. They moved to the trains of endless length, as if it were a weary routine they had practiced for 20 years. As far as you could see were the clusters of faces in the compartment windows. Not one replaceable face. All the photographs and books of boyhood came to life around me. I was living in the exact world of 1914, of World War I. Why were old men preparing wars for young men to die in? It was all the same. The projector had stopped in 1918, and now was turning again. C'est la guerre. That really didn't translate into war. It was just c'est la guerre which you flipped off your tongue like the first hundred years are the hardest chum or it never rains but it pours. And now for the news from Eric Semeride in Paris. Go ahead, Paris. The undramatic fact is that this week nothing spectacular has occurred here in the West. Apparently, all America was sitting beside the radio. New York could not get its fill. My partner Tom Grandin and I were on a relentless treadmill. We were warned over and over again to speak calmly, dispassionately. America, after all, was neutral. This was right. It was the only legitimate way to perform our function, but it was very hard. And now I'll turn you back to Columbia, New York. There were no great battles. There was no fighting of any consequence at all. American wits dubbed it the phony war. There seemed to be a general resentment back home that the contestants were not putting on a more exciting show to titillate the neutrals. Eric Severide, Columbia's war correspondent with the Anglo-French allies, is now ready at French General Headquarters. Go ahead, Eric Severide. In the morning, I was taken to the advance post. For parading within pistol shot of the enemy gives you a very funny feeling. But you don't feel frightened so much as you feel silly and embarrassed. But the German machine gunners completely snubbed me. French soldiers wanted to know what Americans thought of this war. I said Americans thought it was bizarre, and a shout of laughter went up. And they agreed with America. It was not that the French were not brave. All soldiers in the mass are brave. They were not afraid of death. They were unprepared for death. It was not true that they did not think their country worth fighting for. They wished to avoid defeat, but they had no particular wish to win a war. Their last experience had taught them that there is no such thing as true victory for civilized men who have no desire to conquer others. They were sickened by the chauvinist misuse of la gloire, as we, as university students, had been of patriotism. So the French remained inside their forts along the Maginot Line. It was cold and miserable. But they were staying alive, nearly all of them, and nothing counted but that.
There was something shameful about Paris to anyone who knew what millions of other Frenchmen were going through. Yet the Parisians could not see it that way. They thought they were being very brave and carrying on. That's what the American fashion writers said about the Paris couturiers when they arrived to report the latest fashion shows. That's what the theatrical reviews said about music halls like the casino, where Maurice Chevalier sang with much feeling, Paris sera toujours Paris. Paris sera toujours Paris. On peut limiter ses défenses, sa distinction, son élégance, n'en ont alors que plus de prix. Paris sera toujours Paris. In April 1940, the phony war ended. Germany launched a massive offensive, conquering Denmark, Norway, Holland, and Belgium in a few weeks. Now, at the worst possible time, our personal lives came to crisis. My wife gave birth to twin boys. Medical care for civilians was scarce. I made one decision to send Lois and the babies to the United States. Reluctantly, she agreed on the baby's account. Here's a report from Eric Severide from the war zone. I saw five separate bombings. You leave one town and come back an hour later, expecting to find the railway station gone. The people are leaving, but many must stay. They have become fatalistic and stoical. They no longer think of Germans quite as human beings. It came on foot in ox carts and automobiles, on hay wagons through the public square. And some stopped to tell terrible stories of what the Blitzkrieg had done to their homes and families. But first to France for the news as reported by Eric Severide. The French defenses are reforming tonight. New big guns are coming up by road and rail. When the two armies come together, the future of France and all Europe may be decided. What the French did not know was that the Germans were advancing rapidly and the situation was grave. I drove outside and around Paris and found a few soldiers in an intersection here and there. Occasionally an anti-aircraft gun that was manned. I could not accept what my eyes plainly told me. There was no intention to defend the capital. For what was a journalist's duty? Suppose he was clear that France was going down, that the game was up. Had he the right to say this to the world, to the French themselves, so long as even one chance in a thousand remained? It was the first time I had been confronted with the basic problem of reconciling the conflict of professional duty and my duty to a universal cause. The truth is its own justification. I had always been taught and always believed. But was it? Was this always so at all times? I was unable to decide. Each night we expected Paris to be devastated from the air. No one knew what a serious bombing would be like, and imaginations worked overtime. The spell was broken on the 4th of June when the Germans made their first serious bombing raid on the city of Paris. The first bombing of Paris since war began, there were 200 casualties according to the communication act. And of this number, we are told that 40 have died. Paris knew now. Paris knew what the northern cities knew, how it is to sit in the corridor or the dank cellar holding tight to the children who cry with fright at the look in their parents' eyes, how it is to feel the old house quiver to see the plaster peel itself from the wall and dust fill the room, how it is to walk over powdered glass on the sidewalks thick as drifted sand, to have the acrid smell of cordite in the nostrils, my orders were to move out if and when the French government moved. The 10th of June arrived, and I learned that the Paris radio station would be demobilized that night. 
I wrote a broadcast saying that if listeners in America were again to hear a radio voice from Paris, it would be under jurisdiction other than the French. I don't know how many more radio broadcasts can be made from the Paris studio. If there is an interruption, we will try to continue with facilities installed in other towns further south. I was trying to make it clear that the capital was abandoned, that the government was leaving, and that the Germans were on the verge of entry. Paris lay inert, her breathing scarcely audible, her limbs relaxed, and the blood flowed remorselessly from her manifold veins. Paris was dying like a beautiful woman in coma, not knowing or asking why. This was the end. The voices of free men speaking of the fight for freedom in their many tongues were to be heard no more from the traditional capital of liberty. Broadcasting from France was finished for me. I had no heart to carry on reporting from the kind of France that this would be. We knew somehow without inquiring that England would continue to fight. And now England seemed intimate, understandable, and terribly important. I managed to escape the advancing Germans on a Belgian ship bound for Liverpool. Somebody flipped the radio on, and the calm, collected, and very familiar voice of Bill Shire was speaking very slowly and clearly. Negotiations for another armistice, the one to end the present war between France and Germany, began at 3.30 p.m. German summer time this afternoon. What a turning back of the clock, what a reversing of history a wave of grief for the French people swept through me. They had tried heroically here, feebly there. Now they must watch as fascist rule took over their beloved country. I felt that I was part of the defeat. Everything was cut adrift. I no longer had a home. My family was scattered. There was something else. Somehow I had had the idea that war correspondents were a privileged, unhittable species. Well, this war was different. No house, no field, no function could guarantee personal safety. And God, the terrifying violence of bombs nearby. How they stunned the mind, ripped the nerves, and turned one's limbs to water. I wanted terribly much not to die, and yet in calmer moments I realized that on the rational philosophical plane, I was less afraid of death than I had been when I was younger, when death appeared only in the imagination. It was, I think, because I was just beginning to understand that there are forms of life that are worse than death, that there are causes worth dying for. I knew that I myself had come to a crossroads and was taking a turning which I had never expected to take. That the thing had come for which my education and my basic beliefs had not prepared me. For the first time, really, I acknowledged to myself that all my blind hopes that my own people could somehow stay out of war were foolish and impossible hopes. There was no living with fascism, not even for a strong America. I felt that I had just run a tortuous, bewildering course and was breathing hard, but I was satisfied. It was something to come to, to desire your own people to take up arms and join the killing. But there it was. Nothing could be done about it. There was no other way. The course was quite clear now. The duty was to fight with every means available. Truly, in fascism, the underworld had risen. 
and reason itself was under assault. The victory of fascism meant the victory of a new world barbarism among men. It meant the end for a very long time, if not forever, of the long, long struggle toward truth and justice. Next week, the American Experience documents the lives of the women defense workers of World War II. Join us next Tuesday at 9 for the life and times of Rosie the Riveter. And stay with 11 now for Alistair Cook's America. Major funding for this series is provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by this station and other public television stations nationwide. Corporate funding for the American experience is provided by Aetna, Insurance and Financial Services, for more than 130 years, a part of the American experience. <laughs>